Greetings, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Living on Music. I'm Steve Hauk, and um, I've been doing the show for, again, close to three years, um, and every guest has been a wonder in, in their own way, whether they are these incredible local D.C. area community, um, musical community artists, um, or international or national artists, um, legends, anybody has been an incredible experience, and this is no exception. Um, this man's music is still a part of my soul. When I was just learning what music was like, I, uh, growing up in Wilton, Connecticut, um, and about 15 years old, Year of the Cat came out and I remember buying the record and I remember that song embedded itself in my head then. And whenever I've heard that song leading up to this day, uh, if it comes in in a playlist, um, on Spotify or on YouTube music or whatever we're listening to, it gets me and I still love it. And at that period of Al Stewart's career, um, there, you know, there was a huge jump in what he had been building for years. And so what we got to do is not only talk about the moments and and a little bit about what year of the cat was about and what that period of his time was about and what it was like for him. We also talk about his building his musical career uh, from a young man in uh, the outskirts of, of London, um, England, um, in Bournemouth, uh, Bournemouth, uh, England, coastal town on the on the south coast. And he grew through some bands there, um, learned how to kind of intercede and interact and play and build his own guitar playing and things like that, but then went to London and he ended up um, living in an apartment with a or an area a shelter area where a woman was giving people places to live if they didn't have any money and they were building their lives up or homeless or whatever and he had just come to London he didn't have anything going yet would have something going soon and he ended up playing uh, at the folk cellar of this place right here uh, Litchfield Street in London now it's called Souk Restaurant it's um it's a tea room and bar uh, place but this is the site. Of bungees, and we'll talk about that. And people like Dylan, Phil Collins, Cat Stevens, or Rod Stewart, David Bowie, people, everybody was playing in the cellar here, including Al Stewart. We have a clip of him playing a, a song, a bit of a song there from there. And he also, um, there was a guy named Art Garfunkel playing uh, there too. Uh, and coincidentally, where uh, Al Stewart lived in that place with that woman giving people places to live. There was a guy named Paul Simon living there and um, they became deep friends. He could hear music that Paul was playing. That was going to be some of the early music of Simon and Garfunkel. The stories go on about the Beatles interacting with the Beatles in kind of a crazy way uh, on and on and on the people that he's played with, you know, Richard Thompson, Rick Wakeman, Alan Parsons was his producer. The list goes on. This is a, a legend in, in music. Um, and it's not just year of the cat, although that song is embedded in my soul uh, and and so is a lot of that music. His he's got a slew of music. We're going to play clips of stuff that were before Year of the Cat and things like that. That and after he was still doing amazing stuff. He's played Glastonbury, I think five times at least. Played the first time and has played the last time that they had it. And he's playing now. He's he's touring. He plays the Birchmere, our our, our legendary place uh, here uh, on March. Uh, 16th uh he was playing in florida when we recorded this interview um i have had a uh, living on music nation um lady susan valella who was down there didn't know i was interviewing him and posted i hear al stewart singing and he sounds so great and i said hey i'm interviewing him tomorrow i'll tell him that and i did <laughs> at the beginning of the show i told him that susan was listening to this man's voice at 77 years old and it still sounds true and his his career continues so Without further ado, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please raise a glass and give a warm Living on Music welcome to Al Stewart. Al Stewart, I got to tell you, I am so honored to have you on Living on Music. Welcome, sir. How are you? I'm okay. <laughs> You're down south, right? In Florida. I'm in Florida at the moment, yes. And that's true. And I will tell you this, Al, um, uh, Living on Music is the show and my my uh, nation and my members. 
And one of them, Susan Valella, posted about you and America playing on Friday night in Pompano. And before she even knew I was interviewing her, she said, he's singing now and sounding so great. And I just think, you know, you that to me is is such a wonderful thing. It must be, it just must feel wonderful to keep surging along. Uh, well, I, I it beats the alternative, you know. <laughs> right, right. That's, you you uh, keep doing. I mean, I've done it. I've never done anything else. Uh, oddly, I'm, I haven't had any other jobs. Uh, I left school and became a musician, and I've been doing it ever since. So. Oh, and the, what I love that Susan, you know, said, and she was sitting out with her dog uh, <laughs> near outside of the arena, but I could hear it clearly and said, you sounded so wonderful. I had a good personal friend who I'm seeing tonight. My partner, Suzanne, is in a band and she's playing at a big concert this evening. And this woman, Lori Rosen, when I told her I were interviewing her, she said, oh my God, I love his music. I have a station on Pandora called Al Stewart Radio. Mm. And to tell him I say hi. And I said, well, Lori, I will. But look, the point of me bringing those things up, Al, is that you are continuing to roll along. You got a gig tonight in Clearwater, Florida. Tomorrow in Ponte Vedra, you know, how does it feel again? You're used to doing this, but how does it feel to continue to play live? Well, I mean, it's the same as it feels the same as when I was 17. I mean, you just uh, you get up on stage and you twang about and tell a few stories and um, get off. You know? <laughs> right. Exactly. I mean, I, I don't know. It's too late for me to take up professional basketball at this point. So I mean, I, I, <laughs> I have to, uh, you know, I have to do what I do. You know, <laughs> I love I love I love that. There's nothing else I, I know how to do. I actually have no other talents whatsoever. Well, that's not strictly true. I, I, I'm, I'm pretty good at French wine, but beyond that's that, right. I have yes. nothing. <laughs> I, I can, I can rhyme pretty much anything in the world, so that's what I do. How did you get through the last three years of what we were all experiencing, and especially musicians? I started the show, Alan, in the pandemic. I'd been a writer for 25 years in music, but I wanted to give musicians a chance to engage, and they they've loved it for three years. Tell me how you uh, how you all dealt with the last uh, those last times. Um, no, the pandemic. I mean, like everybody else, I mean, we didn't do anything for a couple of years. Didn't go out. Um, you know, we used to go for walks in the afternoon and um, and keep to ourselves. And uh, you know. But obviously didn't didn't do any gigs, you know, and it was it was nice. It was like um, it, it. I mean, having done this for sixty years in the yes. straight line, I've never actually not not played gigs. I mean, I've just right. done it all my life, and yes. it, it becomes a routine. You wake up in the morning and you have a piece of paper that says go go to Cincinnati. So you go to Cincinnati and you play a show, and uh, it it was just remarkable. I mean, for for a couple of years, I didn't have to get out of bed early in the morning. <laughs> And catch a plane and go anywhere you know I mean? right which was uh it's shocking i mean it's i you know i've never had i've never actually had my own life you know what i mean right because you just constantly are, are doing whatever it says on the on the itinerary you just go to wherever it tells you to right. go to. and uh it was uh, I, I loved it we watched lots of movies i did lots of jigsaw puzzles because i like that right and i read you know, hundreds of books right <laughs> Yeah, just keeping up on. I mean, there's um, the, there was a, a, a book, uh, Wolf Hall. Uh, it's a trilogy, it's two thousand pages, and um, I it won a couple of Booker prizes. I think. I mean, it's it's a it's a trilogy. It's a fantastically involved uh, history of um, of Cromwell, uh, Henry the uh, uh, right. minister. And um, I, it was intimidating. And, and I thought, well, I'm, I'm never going to get around to reading that. And of course, as soon as the pandemic hit, I thought, well, now I'm going to read it. Right. <laughs> right. I said I read all three volumes of it and it was extraordinary. I so love you, that. You can, you can do things like that. And I watched endless movies. And um, one day, you know, like it, it was time to go back to work. And here we are again. I mean, yeah. absolutely. Um, and Al, you're part of the, the joy of all of us who've loved your music for so many years is the songwriting. Do you continue to do songwriting yourself? Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah. on, on the English tour in 2019, we did uh, five new songs. Yes. Uh, which are unrecorded. They're still unrecorded. I mean, I'm not. I, I, it, part of me thinks that um, if you were to go back and make records, I mean, for septuagenarian folk singers, which I am one of, right. um, <laughs> um, you know, it it it's like you know, someone has invented the light bulb and you invest all your money in a candle factory. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> <That's>, you know. <laughs> so, but I mean, I, I write I write all kinds of things for my own amusement, you know. 
Right. And again, uh, the songs that you've written and, you know, beyond Year of the Cat, even and On the Border and all of those from that era, just throughout your career, the early and, and after that, I loved so much. And it's it's rung through my head when you were a young youngster born in in Glasgow and then moved, I guess, to England um, when you were quite young. Where was the musical influence for Al Stewart? Where did it begin in those early days for you? Well, I can tell you exactly what happened in England because I was there and I was in the middle of it. Um, there were two records that came out a, a few years apart from each other that completely changed the complexion of English society and uh, changed my life and everybody else's. And the first one was by a guy called Lonnie Donegan. Wow. And, yes. Uh, he made a record called The Rock Island Line, which yes. is a fantastic record. And uh, he... He didn't know what to call it. It was a, a music unlike anything else. It was basically American folk music played at 300 miles an hour. It was like everything was like full tilt constantly. It was like it just built up to these amazing climaxes. Right. And uh, in England in 1950, apparently they sold, um, I think it was 6,000 guitars for the whole country in the whole year. And it was mostly people singing cowboy songs. And, right. You know, Home on the Range or <laughs> all this stuff. And Lonnie Dunnigan uh, basically invented this, you know, manic form of like very, very high speed folk music. And he called, right. he called it skiffle because nobody, oh, yes. nobody knew what it was. No. Um, so uh, he became he became the biggest, you know, biggest thing in England. I mean, as big as Elvis was in America. Oh, wow. And, um, oh. you know, he had like 30 or so top 10 hits in a row, including... Yes four number ones i think in one year alone right and um in 1957 uh, 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 like almost everybody wanted to be in a skiffle band i mean it's, it's how john lennon met paul mccartney I mean, right i mean uh, john lennon was in the quarry men and they were in the quarry men because of Lonnie Donegan. I mean, exactly uh you know like jimmy page was in a skiffle group all of all of these people who would go on to become the british invasion were all in skiffle groups so it was all because of Lonnie. And um, yeah. by the end of 1957, in that one year alone, 250,000 guitars were oh. sold in England, all because of Lonnie Donegan, and the people who bought them became the British invasion. Right. So, so that's that's the first that is the first plank, and uh, you know without him, none of this is possible. And then oh. there was an uh, there was an and right after that in 1958, rock and roll had really taken root in England, but the English people couldn't play it. They just didn't know how to play it. Right. And the American records were so great and everybody loved them. And uh, you know, my entire collection was basically all American artists. Oh. And I think everybody of my age, it was the same thing. And uh, uh, there, there was a, a very, very influential man on um, a television show, first rock and roll show in England. Uh, the show was called Oh Boy. Right. After the Holly song. Right. And and his name was Jack Good. Oh. And Jack Good listened to uh, all the new records and, and the, the British ones were rubbish. And he, he would just kind of throw them away and, and put his hands up in despair and say, oh, God, why can't we do this? You know, Right. And one day he gets a, a record by a, a new guy called Cliff Richard. And the record is dreadful. It was called Teenage Crush or something. Oh. I don't know what the heck it was. It was just <laughs> another of these awful English records. And, and he's like, oh, no. And uh, and then he says um, in, in Pete Frame's absolutely incredible book, um, uh, uh, Jack Good says, I don't know what possessed me to turn the record over. I've never done that in my life. Before. Oh, God. I, don't know what I was thinking. He turns <sighs> the record over and starts playing the B-side. 15 minutes later, he's dancing around oh. the room, waving his hands in the air and saying, this is the most fantastic thing I've ever heard in my life. Oh. And the record was called Move It. Oh, my and God. It was really interesting because it, it was written by Ian Samwell, and he wrote it on the bus on the way to the studio oh. because they didn't oh. have a new side. So Jack, Jack Good phones up the record company and says, look, oh. I will have your boy Cliff Richard on my show, but he's got to sing Move It. I don't want to know anything about this A-side. It's terrible. Uh, <laughs> Re-release the record with the, with the B-side as the A-side. Oh. And he did. And Jack Good called up a guy called Marty Wilde, who was the biggest pop star in England at the time. Right. Said, Marty, you've got to come around and listen to this. 
So Marty goes around to uh, to Jack Good's place. Jack Good plays him Move It. Marty Wells says, that is one of the best things I've ever heard in my life. Oh. And then he paused and he says, isn't it a tragedy that no one in England could make a record like that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. So the, so the Move It transfer, I mean, it, it changed everything. It, it made Cliff Richard a... a, a huge star i mean right the english elvis his yes. backing band the shadows had 30 top 10 hits of their own right and, um it, it it and that was it after that uh from the shadows you get the beatles and then you get the british invasion right but those two records basically to me uh rock hand online and move it are the two cornerstones of the whole english rock and roll movement and then that how did that initiate al stewart to begin when did you pick up your first well, I, I got i like like everybody because of Lonnie, i bought a guitar and the first oh. thing, first thing i loved to play on the guitar actually was the peter gunn theme because i was oh. a fan, fan of Dwayne eddie and the down 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 yes down. Da, da. nice <laughs> uh and the second thing i learned how to play was move it it was the oh. end of it, you know and um that so that was it we were off and running we we're all off and running i think yes. pretty much you know, you look at Page and Clapton and Beck and all the rest of it, and everybody really came from the from basically from that start. It, it's, I mean, everybody owes a debt to Hank B. Marvin of the Shadows because everybody wanted to play like him. Oh, that's spectacular! Yeah, what a wonderful thing to uh, to reminisce on when that kicked off. And you was that in Bournemouth or did you move to Bournemouth yes, later? Well, I was I was in Bournemouth when all that was happening. Bournemouth seems seems like, and again, we will talk about it as we go along. But it it's always seemed like a place you finally left to go to London. But before you left. You went through the Sabres, the Trappers, the G-Men. Yes. Was yes. that that was your time to really surge through bands at that moment? Yeah, I was in all those bands, and yes. I, I was like seventeen, and I I could play all the Shadows hits, and that's basically what I did. I mean, I must have played Apache a thousand times. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that! And and Al, there's one fabulous story. I guess you were about, I want to think about eighteen years old ish when you uh, went to see the Beatles. At yeah, the Belmont I, Cinema and, and with John Kramer. Tell tell what happened when, with that moment. Well, yeah, I ruined a Beatle concert. It's probably the, um, <laughs> the height of my career. <laughs> um, well, we, we saw the Beatles were playing. Uh, in those days, you played, um, you know, two shows a night, six nights a week. And, and they were playing at the Gaumont Theatre in Bournemouth. <sighs> and uh, we saw the first show on the first night. And uh, my friend who ran a record store, um, said we have to go back and meet the Beatles. And I said right. we meet the Beatles. I mean, right. you know, we'd seen Hard Day's Night. It was all the girls screaming and you know, how, how to meet the Beatles. And he and he said, well, what's that guitar John Lennon's playing? You know, like it's the black one from Hard Day's Night. And I said, well, I think it's a Rickenbacker. I think that's what it's called. And he said, that's it. He said, <laughs> he said, let's go and see the manager of the Goma. So we did. And um, uh, he said, look, we, we we represent Rickenbacker guitars and we've come all the way down from London. This is a 16 year old talking. Right. <laughs> and oh, we'd, like, could... we'd like to see our client, John Lennon, oh. in one of our guitars. And, <laughs> um, so I'm backing towards the door at this point. I don't want any part of this conversation. I think we're going to be thrown out on our ears. But the manager was so panicked by all the pa pandemonium going on around oh. That he he picked up the phone. He called the you know the police were all around the stage door, and he called right. the stage door and gave the guy our names and said that you know to let us in. So we walked through. They had a police escort. They they pushed the crowds away so we could get through to the stage oh, door. Oh my god! And these are people who are our age that we knew. <laughs> <laughs> they must have been going hey whoa yeah whoa whoa, whoa. and um you know so so we get into the theater and uh you know we go and knock on the beatles uh stage door and john lennon comes out and he's bored because he's not doing anything between the shows right and um i say oh that, that rickenbacker you're playing i mean I, I i've never actually played one of those i'm a guitar player too <laughs> oh. and he, he goes out and he comes back with a Rickenbacker and he hands it to me. Oh. So, so I put it up around my neck and I play a few Chuck Berry refs just, just to let him know that, you know, like I'm on the level. <laughs> oh, my. And, um, yeah, long story short, he says, what did you think of the show? And I said, well, it was the greatest show I've, I've, rock show I've ever seen in my oh. life. I said, it's just great. And then I made a mistake. I was, I was sitting right in the middle, right in front of uh, George's amplifier. And amplifiers in those days are one directional. So you hear what's coming out of whatever's in front of you. Oh. And um, 
I said I couldn't really hear it too, couldn't really hear you too well because I could only hear George. And uh, you know, I hear bloody George. <laughs> and, but, you know, like, I don't think anything about it. I, I get on with my business. And uh, I go home. And the next morning, um, the, the newspaper, the, the Bournemouth Echo is, uh, you know, I, I wake up really late because I couldn't sleep. I mean, I just met a beetle, you know. And, um, you know, so I look at the review and there, it reviews both shows. And it said, first show, Beatles, fantastic, greatest band ever. It said, best. And then all it said about the second show is in the second show, John Lennon played so loud that we couldn't hear anything else. <laughs> I, I thought, oh, my God, that's me. I did that. <laughs> oh god that is classic well what a what a moment i'm boggling i mean it's like it probably my biggest musical moment was to ruin a beetle concert oh god that is classic i love that when i saw that i thought well that must have been still such a an amazing moment um you were well, I, I felt very bad about it <laughs> i couldn't do anything about it at that point and but then yeah. of course we spent I mean, we, we the next day we went to their hotel and and this time we pretended to be writers for the Bournemouth Echo and so we got <laughs> we, we got into a press conference. With Perfect. Them. <laughs> wow. And my friend broke George Harrison's pencil getting an. Oh. Old and I don't know. <laughs> you guys are leaving your your marks on the Beatles. That is classic. Yeah, I mean, well, Ringo Starr summed us up the best. I mean, uh, he he came down the staircase and we were standing at the bottom of the staircase, and he just looked at us and pointed to the front door of the hotel and he said, "Your mates went that way." Oh, did he really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is spectacular. Mm -hmm. Well, those are those are wonderful moments. Um, around that time, a little later, you decided, and I love the quote I found, it was, I decided to come up to London when I was 19 with a corduroy jacket and a head full of dreams. And yeah. you decided that was the that was what made sense to go from where you were to London. Well, I was a rock and roller in Bournemouth. And um, at some point in, in Bournemouth, I discovered Bob Dylan. Yes, you did. And, uh, you know, no one else in Bournemouth knew who Bob Dylan was. And, and I, I thought, well, you know, this is really interesting stuff. And uh, I bought the freewheeling and, and um, there was a song on it called Masters of War. And I started playing it right. at rock shows on an acoustic guitar when the rest of the band went to the pub. And, and in those days, I had to play Twist and Shout three times a night, and right. I played Wipeout three times a night, and nobody applauded. They loved it. They danced to it, but they didn't applaud. I played Masters of War, and the whole room started oh. clapping. And I thought, as Dylan would later say, something is happening here, but you don't know what it is. Do right. You? And um, oh. and I, I went to London because I thought, well, in London, maybe they will have heard of this, you know, this Bob Dylan, the first yes. <laughs> yeah exactly we called him we didn't know and totally. um, so i went up to london and uh three uh, three things happened in quick succession and then they changed my life really yes uh, bob dylan was playing at the royal albert hall That's so i right. went and you know i mean the beatles played for 25 minutes you know what i mean <laughs> bob dylan played for two hours oh. on his own with just an acoustic guitar oh. so i didn't know that was possible i mean i'd, I'd never seen anything like right. it right and you could hear a pin drop. I mean, the Albert Hall, everybody was absolutely you know, like that. And I thought, well, there's more to this than meets the eye. I should give this a go. So I started to go to folk clubs just to listen yes. to local singers. Yes. First guy I saw was a, a, a guy called Bert Chance. Okay. And Bert Chance was the most incredible guitar player. I thought, how is he doing this? I mean, Jimmy Page called him the Jimi Hendrix of the acoustic guitar. That's right. Was. And, uh, and I thought, oh, my Lord. I mean, if, if there are people in London that can can play like that, I mean, I don't stand a chance. I mean, what am I going to do? And um, so I thought, I've got to learn how to do this. He was yeah. playing with his fingers and uh, and a thumb pick. And, and I'd never, I don't know what that was. And and so I, I, I thought, OK, I'll, I'll I've got to learn this. I've got to learn how to how to do this. Right. So I saw Bob Dylan. I saw Bert Chance, and uh, I I was living in a. But there was a a woman in the East End of London who took in homeless folk singers, and oh. and you know, she she thought they were, she she was the parish visit, visitor of Soho, worked at the Church of England. Right. And um, you know she thought folk singers were the new apostles in some way. So wow, great! Said, you a folk singer? I say yes, I'm a folk singer. You can oh. come so I went and stayed in, in her apartment. And one day she said, you've got to move out, um, not out of the apartment, but you've got to move into the next room because um, there's this American who always stays here when he comes to England. 
And uh, I said, fine, you know, he's, and, and he, he's going to have your room. It's his room, actually. And, and I said, I'll live, I'll live in the next room. What's his name? And she said, Paul Simon. Paul Simon. Oh, yes. So, so then I'm living next door to Paul Simon. I've just seen Bob Dylan and Bert Chance. And, and uh, I, I heard Paul writing all these songs through, through the wall. Oh. I'm sitting in the railway station. Oh, my gosh. For my procrastination. Yeah. Destination. Destination. That's <laughs> so, right. I thought, well, that's how you do it. You know what I mean? Oh. And um, so Paul would come out and, and you always look around for, you know, um, anybody you can play a new song to because you don't know if it's any good you want a reaction right of course the only person in the apartment was this 19 year old idiot namely me oh and paul is like oh my god all right okay I'll, I'll look. <laughs> so he plays me these songs and i oh my god oh my lord <laughs> oh what? my god yeah. so now I've, I've seen bob dylan bert chance and and paul simon so i mean and I'm, I'm saying if this is the bar it is set yes. really really high <laughs> i don't know how to compete in this oh world. well at that <laughs> right right and at, at that time you got your your weekly slot at bungie's coffee house yes if you, if you look behind me there is the site of bungie's coffee house where you played that's now yeah. the it's now the soak the, the souk re, uh, restaurant i believe it's called but this is where you went in and played i have a clip that i'd love to roll for people just okay. a little part of it and this is from Bungie's in 1964, where Al is playing 65, song, 65 sorry. Um, and it was um, a, a very interesting song called Pretty Golden Hair. Yeah. And that will give a little bit of background before we show people a little, oh, a, a little uh, tiny clip. Yeah, it was uh, Pretty Golden Hair. Yeah, murder by his Pretty Golden Hair. It was, it was about the gay, yes. gay scene in, in, in yes. London at the time and a, and a guy who committed suicide. Oh, and you, I, I let your quote was suddenly I was surrounded by everybody in drag and they dug it like like mad. And that yeah, must have been wild. I, I, I mean, I, I'm married. I, I'm, 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 I'm not gay. I never right. haven't been, ever been gay. But, right. Um, I found myself in the middle of all of this. And, and I wrote so I wrote this song for them. And, and all of a sudden they loved it. And uh, right. There well, you go. And the beauty of your voice was building right in this clip, too, Al. I, I really mean that, too. Ladies and gentlemen, a little bit of the early part of Al Stewart from uh, Bungie's Coffee House, which you see behind me and was an instrumental part of his <laughs> early beginning. And here's a little bit of Pretty Golden Hair. Yep. That he was born, proud relations came to form and compliment his pretty golden hair. In boyhood sent away to a boarding school to stay, its crumbling proud traditions forced to bear. And his friends in this new world said he looks more like a girl with those blue eyes and pretty golden hair. From safe, secluded youth into manhood's search for truth, his mother's eyes now wet and turn to stare. For he said, I must be bound this day for London town. I do believe my fortune's waiting there. Well, there you go, everybody. There's Al in 1965 at Bungie's. Uh, Al, things began. You did your first recording, which was on Jackson Frank's debut album, where yes. pr produced by your roommate, I, I <laughs> That's right. Paul, Paul Simon. I love that. And you also became friendly with this very interesting, even at times odd back then, Japanese artist. Oh, Yoko. <laughs> called Yoko Ono, who was my first interview that I did 20 years ago for my my own music career. And what a wonderful chat we had she was doing john's art tour right uh, and it was she was so sweet and wonderful what was the uh the moment behind that you invested in a in a film she did called number four yeah film number four it was yes. 360 naked bottoms it was right. like, much in the style of andy Warhol. <laughs> my god <laughs> um yoko with she i used to go to these underground um the underground club called UFO. We right. have the psychedelic bands. The Pink Floyd were the house band there. I mean, it's like, and uh, you know, because it was you, you met a, a load of really interesting people there. And Yoko uh, came up on stage and said she was looking for investors because uh, she was making a movie, oh. and she wanted a hundred pounds, which is all the money I had in the world at the time. Right. And uh, but Yoko can be very persuasive. Right. <laughs> so yes, she, she can. And, and she talked me into becoming a, a, she said I could be a co-producer on film number four. And I thought, well, I, I co-producer of a film. I'm 19. I mean, like, you know, how bad can that be? So I gave her the hundred pounds 
she made film number four. It came out, I think four people saw it. Six days later, I got a check through the mail signed by John Lennon for a hundred. Oh, God. <laughs> And um, yeah, I mean that that is a huge dilemma in itself because what do you do? Do you cash it? I mean, uh, or do you keep it? It's an artifact, you know. Totally. But we needed to eat, so I cashed it. I've never seen it again. But oh. uh, that was that. That that is what a, what another wonderful story. Your your first record single was the Elf, which was um, um, the version of the Yardbirds' Turn into Earth, which I I love that. And you had a guy named Jimmy Page. Yeah play on it with you that must have been a fun moment too as well was he because he was still early Yardbirds life <laughs> Jimmy was a session guy uh in yeah. London, which is where he ended up on my record and I'd learned by that time I'd, I'd begun to pay serious attention to the um to the, the folk scene and, uh, and to how to play you know right folk. and a lot of them were doing things that you can't do in normal tunings so they were using um the, all these different guitar tunings one of which was Dadgad D-A-D-G-D -D -D. Oh. And uh, and I knew how to play Dadgad, and and I thought, oh, well, I, I can teach it to Jimmy because he'll never have heard of this, and he oh. hadn't. And um, uh, Bert played a song called Black Waterside, and it was so oh, and just an amazing piece of guitar playing. My God, I, I I sweated myself into oblivion over trying to learn how to do that, but I eventually kind of got it down, and I taught it to Jimmy. I mean, like in between takes when we're sitting around. And I thought nothing of it until, of course, it, it, it ended up on a Led Zeppelin album. And now it was called Black Mountain Side. Oh. <laughs> and try, I can tell the story now because uh, yeah. but it's gone. I, I couldn't tell this story during his lifetime. Oh, and, that's uh, fantastic. Nathan Joseph, who owned the record label that Bert was on, <clears throat> uh, decided to, to sue Led Zeppelin because it was, you know, it was a, a basically it was Bert's arrangement. Oh. And um, Peter Grant, was the manager of Led yes. Zeppelin. He's, you know, he's a great big ex-professional wrestler. I was not, I knew his reputation. Right. They wanted to haul me into court, man. I'm, I'm not going anywhere near Peter Grant. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, you know, so nothing happened with it. And um, funny story, because 40 years later, um, I was playing a concert in London Right, and uh, we invited uh, um, Bert to come along and play a song with us. So we'd recorded one of his tunes, and um, we said, uh, you know, do you want to come along and, and uh, do a song with us at the concert? And he did. It was it was very nice, and we played it, and it was great. Oh, this is Bert Chance, you know, like and my early hero, and now he's on stage with me, and. Um, so, you know, everybody went home and the, the last two people in the dressing room were actually Bert and, and myself. Oh, my God. As I'm leaving, Bert said, um, he said, I've got a new uh, new album. I've just finished it. He said, and uh, I'd like to give you a copy. And I said, oh, that's, that's wonderful. You know, it's like, I, I'd love it, love to have it. So I take it. And again, I'm on my way out of the door carrying my guitar case. And Bert says, wait a minute. And Bert doesn't say anything. I mean, oh. we, we never used to talk. And now he's talking. And I, I, I'm waiting and I can't imagine what he's about to say. And all he said to me was, and don't play that to Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Oh, my God. <laughs> so whatever he, you do. He knew for 40 years that I was the one who taught Jimmy how to play uh, Black Water Side. And he'd never said anything. Oh. He'd never let me know that he knew, you know. And oh, so that's... just finally, and then he died shortly after that, but yeah. he couldn't resist telling me at the end oh. of his life. Spectacular. <laughs> no, it was me. Yes. Oh my God. That is, that is wonderful. Um, and you, you signed with Columbia records and then did six records. You had your debut bedstitter images. You had, um, a no love Chronicles. Love, love Chronicles, which in fact, Jimmy Page played on. Yes, he did. And Richard Thompson too, who just played oh, here. I've interviewed him before. He just played in Washington, um, right near here, and at the, the Birchmere, where, where you'll be in two weeks. Right. Um, yes, and you you heard about Gary Olsey, the owner of the Birchmere, passed away. Oh no, I didn't know that. Yes, I meant to. I was meaning to tell you. Uh, yeah, about uh, three weeks ago. So it kind of it's been a pretty pretty sad time over there. But it's the Birchmere. So um, it's the Birchmere, you got to play there. Everybody does. It yeah. is. It, I love that place. Um, you had zero she zero she flies. Um, which Jimmy Page also played on. Right, he did, and he and that came out that came out during a, a pretty heavy personal breakup you were doing, and it kind of did it did it stimulate the music that you were writing and the and the no, time of your life. Brought it, all, brought it all to a dead stop, I think. I mean, I, I it it was very very tough to get over that breakup. It was, you I, know, I bet. 
it was a really hard time. Um, it had two effects. One was that I um, did a whole album about it. I mean, uh, the, the orange. Orange is the color of madness, I think I yes. found out later. Yes. And then uh, listening back to it and listening to Love Chronicles, which, of course, I had written for the girl that, you know, broke up with me. Right. Um I listened back to this stuff and, and I thought, I, I can't do this anymore. I can't write love songs anymore. I, I, just, I just can't. I mean, it, it's it, it's just too miserable an experience. Wow. And I thought, what else, what else am I interested in? And of course, the answer was history. I've always yes. loved history. Um, so I, I said to myself, what would happen if I wrote an entire album of historical songs? I mean, the first thing I thought would happen is that nobody would listen to it and nobody right. would buy it because, you know, no, I mean, nobody's done that, you know. Right. Um, and then I thought, yeah, that, let's make it really interesting. <laughs> let's, right. let's not make it English history, something people can relate to, or American history. And let, let's have a big slice of Russian history. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> And I wrote Reds to Moscow and, uh, you know, based on the German invasion of Russia in World War II. And that's an eight minute song. And I yeah. thought, you know, no one's going to listen to this. I mean, it, and um, it, the the album came out and it outsold all the, the four first albums put together. Right. And uh, all of a sudden I was um, I was a historical folk rock singer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Probably the only one in the world. I mean, right. And all of this really came about because I had this terrible breakup and didn't want to write love songs anymore. So. Oh, isn't that fascinating? What a way to to alter your songwriting into something that, again, carried you through almost your entire career and and has been incredible. You also played Glastonbury for the first time around then. Right. For a thousand, a thousand hippies who paid a pound each and had free milk. <laughs> yeah, a pound each. Yeah. Um, there were only about six acts, I think. I can't remember. I remember some of the other ones. And um, yeah, I was there. There's a picture of me on stage at the first. Yes. Festival, festival, yeah. uh, that's wonderful. Um, Rick Wakeman played on Orange, which I yeah. thought was fascinating. And yeah. and that that's neat. I love the yeah. disc, and, disc and music echo talking about the thought of Al Stewart going electric is enough to bring his most ardent fans out in a cold sweat. <laughs> but, but fear not, Pharrell has produced an album up well up to his remarkable Love Chronicles, and his voice still has that fake quality. Guitar playing has improved. I mean, that that must have been a neat moment too. I'd love to play a, a, a minute of a song that I I've gone through all your songs and loved so many of that the stuff from the uh, the early days as well. This is a little bit with Rick Wakeman on the piano, and boy, you can't help hearing Rick. I've I've interviewed him too, and uh, and what is yeah. what a, what an amazing guy he is uh, in He's so, the so many ways. He's the man you're ever going to meet in your life. And a stand-up? I mean, all, all the way through the whole process of making that record, he would just keep really? telling jokes. I mean, oh, just God. Well, I'm I, trying to I, concentrate I, on singing, and I, in my headphones, all I can hear is, here, Al, heard the one about the charm. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that he was a stand-up comedian for he years. He is a stand-up comedian, yes. Yeah, so one of the best. <laughs> and I, I don't think anybody, a lot of people, even yes, some Yes fans didn't know that. Here's a little clip, you guys, from... Uh, from the album uh, Orange. This is a wonderful clip with you can hear Rick, but I love hearing Al's voice as it grows and grows. A little bit of the news from Spain. To be learning, and you don't know if or when you'll be returning. It depends on how everything works out. If it can somehow in and I have heard the news from Spain. Yeah, there's Rick on the background and a piece of that uh, of that album. 73, you had Past, Present, and Future, um, which was your first record to re receive a, a proper release in the United States. Is that, yeah, is that right? that's right. Yeah, it made number yeah. 133 in the chart. <laughs> uh, hey, you know, top 200. That we'll bad. <laughs> See, you were growing. Uh, you, you got up there, but you were growing. It was a huge shift, though, I guess, uh, songwriting from this introversion to kind of an all-encompassing historical slant as you just kind of emoted to, right? Yeah, I yeah. had to do it. 
I, I couldn't write love songs anymore. I, I mean, the, you, I couldn't go there. And, um, and right in a, in a way, it's good. I, I think that everyone, everyone who writes songs probably begins with love songs. It, it's universal, you know, because uh, everybody can relate to them, you know. Right. And in a way, I mean, I wouldn't go through that breakup again for anything in the world. But right. in a way, it was uh, fortuitous in the sense that it just took me out of, you know, doing what everybody else was doing, you know. Right. Oh, that's fascinating. That really is. We are going to play a little bit of a clip from that, if I may, Al, from Past, Present and Future. It is an incredible song. We'll play a couple of minutes. It's nine minutes long. We're going to play a couple of minutes from this wonderful song from Past, Present, and Future that kind of sums up where Al was and what was going on. This is a little bit of Nostradamus. <laughs> She'll fall and put to death by the English Parliament. She'll be fire and plague to London come in the year of six and twenty-three. An emperor of France shall rise who will be born near Italy. His rule cast his empire dear. Napoleon, his name shall be. Frank out come and the government driven out shall be an English king seeks divorce and from his throne cast down as he one named Hister shall become a captain of greater Germany no law does this man observe and bloody his rise and fall shall be yep that shows the that shows the depth of your songwriting style that was beginning to really that i mean again al that took over a, a large part of your your songwriting flavor didn't it yeah and I, I, erica cheatham was um a writer in england who was writing a book on nostradamus eventually i think she wrote three books oh. um and i wanted to I, you know she'd written a big article in um, vanity fair or one of those magazines and uh but I thought, well, if I'm going to write about Nostradamus, I'm going to get it from the source. You know, she's the authority. And so I phoned her up and said, I'm writing a song. Can I come around and, and can you tell me all about it? Wow. And so I literally went to her apartment and um, and she was in the midst of writing the book. And I said, well, what are the most significant quotations, you know, from Nostradamus um, do, in your opinion? And she gave me the, you know, this this whole bunch of quatrains that he'd written. And uh, I said, well, this is pretty easy. All I got to do is rhyme them. So I, <laughs> so I did and put them into the song. So uh, I don't have any belief either pro or con about whether Nostradamus, you know, could see the future. I don't know that. Right. Um, I, I'm just, I just transferred what Erica Cheatham told me. And, um, and, and the, then the song came out and people liked it. And, and okay, well, it's a song, you know? <laughs> yeah, and it was a hit on on college radio stations, which I thought was fa wonderfully fascinating in that period where people loved that, kind of started to love the long story type of music that was out there. And that seemed to do a, a wonderful run on, on U.S. college university radio. Um, also, um, the next phase was 75. You uh, released Modern Times, and this was the first of three with Mr. Alan Parsons. Yeah. Um, this first record, did that go a little bit lighter on historical and return a little bit to short stories set to music type um, things? We when it's, I started working with, I wanted to make a folk rock record because right. uh, Past, Present, and the Future is basically a, a historical record. It's not really folk rock. Um, and I thought for folk rock, what I what I really need well, I think I'd, I'd got a new manager and he was a disc jockey on, on a radio station in Philadelphia. Wow. And he said, Americans love great lead guitar players. And so you've got to find one. And there was only one guy that, that I was even remotely interested in working with. And that was Tim Rennick. Wow. And I thought he was the best guitar player in England. And um, so I went to Tim Rennick and I said, I'm making an album. Do you want to play on it? And he said, sure. And uh, so now, I, now I've, I'm beginning to assemble a team at this point. And right. now I've got Alan Parsons producing and I've got yeah. Tim Rennick playing lead guitar. Right. What could possibly go wrong? Well, I mean, the, the, the only thing that could go wrong is me writing the wrong songs. But um, I, I kind of did, did more straight ahead, um, you know, like folk rock. Uh, and Tim played these incredible solos. I mean, like, all the best solos, I think, on any any of my records. And uh, they're all on that record on Modern Times. Oh, I love that. <laughs> solo on Carol or The Dark and the Rolling Sea or, or Modern Times itself. I mean, yep. 
I mean, these are amazing solos. And uh, so I, I I got through finishing it off and I thought, well, you know, this this sounds pretty good. I mean, right. the early records sounded like they were produced through a brick wall. And, and this one, because of, you know, because of Alan Parsons, Parsons. doing the producing right. and, and playing the guitar. I mean, it began to sound to me. I, I thought this is really sounding like a proper record. And uh, the record did make the top 30 in America and it did make the top 30 in the UK, the first one to do it. And uh, I thought, well, wow. <laughs> wow, exactly. I still, I'd made six albums. I still hadn't had a hit single anywhere in the world, but I had made six albums at this point. Right. And this song right here, we're going to show a little clip of is from that. And you just mentioned it from modern times, you guys, Al Stewart's 1975, part of his wonderful career. Here's a little bit of Carol. Sometimes it seems unimaginable that you were ever any other way With your white rose face and your open clothes in brighter jeans and silver chains You're a well-known face in all the hangout places where the lost souls congregate You sit all night but you talk too fast, I don't know what you're trying to say Oh Carol, I think it's time for run at the cover Yeah, everyone's a nobody's lover, uh-huh You got a one-way ticket for all your yesterdays I know your daddy said he'd talk to you But he never really found the time And your TV mother with the cocktail eyes Could never really reach your mind So you fixed your star to a passing dream And took a cocaine holiday now the years flow around you in a muddy stream You need another place to stay Oh, Carol, I think it's time for running for cover Uh-huh, believe me Yeah, everyone's a nobody's lover Uh-huh, you got a one-way ticket for all your yesterday Reach down, silvery ship from the stars and know you I love that. And again, it's showing uh, where Al Stewart is going with his his growing songwriting and everything is is going along wonderfully. Your contract with CBS Records expired. You signed to RCA for just the world outside North America. Is that kind of what you wanted to do to spread out a little bit? First album was a song uh, with a title cut that is, is again, um, it is enveloped in my brain as a 62 year old. And this came out when I was 15 years old. And Year of the Cat was released, and you did it at Abbey Road. Is that correct? Yeah, Abbey Road. Yeah. Now, yeah. what was that like? Oh, uh, it was great. I, I mean, bet. well, it was great, except the was um, the miners were on strike, which meant the power kept going out all the time. So, oh. I mean, periodically you'd be plunged into pitch darkness, and you'd have to go to the pub for an hour or something, and then come back when the power came back on. But you know, so it it, it, <laughs> it was an interesting process, but. By now, we'd, we'd actually assembled the team that I was looking for. We had, um, Alan had produced um, a band called Cockney Rebel. Right. Uh, and they'd had a number one hit in England with uh, Come Up and See Me, Make Me Smile. And um, he liked the rhythm section particularly. It was Stuart Elliott playing drums and George Ford playing bass. And you always start, I mean, if you're building a band, you, right. you, you start right there. You need, you, right. need the, you need the solid underpinning. And uh, so we got those two people in. We had Tim Rennick, of course, already playing guitar. We got Peter Wood in to play piano, um, who would later go on to walk, work with the Pink Floyd. Uh, oh, yeah. As, as would Tim. And um, and then we got in um, Peter White uh, to, you know, to be a backup piano player. And, and we discovered he could play Spanish guitar. He'd never played Spanish guitar. I'd never seen him do it. I didn't know he could do it. 
and we were doing on the border and um, Alan Parsons said can anyone play Spanish guitar and Peter said I can so I went home and I got a Spanish guitar and, and um, what you hear on the record I think is the second take he just picked up the guitar and played it oh absolutely so then we got um, Andrew Powell in um, wow. to do the string arrangements he would go on to produce Kate Bush um, what, yeah. what the Heights, that's, that's his production and then we had um, we did it at Abbey Road and uh with a team like that, I mean, the only thing that could possibly go wrong would be if I screwed up the songs, you know, because of the, it, and, and in order not to do that, we actually recorded all the music before I wrote any of the lyrics. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Yeah. I remember I, reading I, that. Oh. I took home, I took home the backing tracks. We had nine backing tracks and um, I would wake up in the morning and I would write multiple sets of lyrics. I mean, I'd write lyrics on many different subjects um, if it needed four verses, I'd write 12. And uh, because I wanted to, you know, like to edit it at the end and, and uh, choose the best bits. Uh, I'm not sure I did choose the best bits because I got a whole exercise book full of different lyrics I wrote for that for, for that record. I mean, Year of the Cat alone, it, it began life as it was called Foot of the Stage. And it was about right. an English comedian. Yeah, but, Tony, Han Tony Hancock, right? Yeah, Hancock, yeah. And then for a while, I, I spoofed it and I, I wrote Horse of the Year about Princess Anne. Oh. Princess Anne rode off on the Horse of the Year. Oh, God. That's <laughs> and the, great. The record company eventually said, stop doing this. <laughs> Just pick a set of lyrics and stick to it. Uh, oh. I, had a, I had a girlfriend who um, had a book on Vietnamese astrology and it was open as a chapter called The Year of the Cat. And I said, that's it. Oh, that is amazing. Uh, and there's a reason why. Uh, and the reason was that Bob Dylan, when he started, wrote what I used to call old songs, Chimes right. of Freedom, Paths of Victory, Masters of War, uh, Walls of Red Wing, all these old songs. If you have of in the middle of uh, a title, right. it looks like it must mean something important. And, <laughs> and so Year of the Cat to me was an of song. And um, I, I just sort of took it. Well, I, I took it from the, the movie Casablanca, obviously, but um, I always thought of it as an off song. You know? Right. Did you feel did you feel when when you when you wrote it and released it, that, that it would be something that would be so in, in kind of ensconced in our in our souls for, for for decades? It really is a song that doesn't go away in any way. Right now, when I hear it, it sounds like it just came out yesterday to me. Yeah, um, I no, I, I had no idea. I mean, it was six and a half minutes long. I mean, right. But, I put it last on the album to get it out of the way. I, mean, I, thought, <laughs> I don't want to put people off with this long thing. Let's let, let start with the commercial things, you know. Uh, so, but I've never been able to pick commercial music since I was probably about 14 when I could do it all the time then. But, right. Yeah. Right. Yes. It uh, Again, it rings true forever. Real quick clip, you guys, from what he was just talking about, Al from Year of the Cat. You're going to see the band. You're going to see Peter playing some of that Mexican. This is a little bit of a video from on the border from africa the winds they talk of changes coming the torches flare up in the night the hand that sets the farms alight to spread the word to those who are waiting on the border in the village where i grew up nothing seems the same still you never see the change from day to day no one notices the customs slip away Late last night the rain was knocking on my window I moved across the darkened room and in the lamp glow I thought I saw down in the street the spirit of the century telling us that we're all standing on the border. There you see, on the border, it's another piece of Al Stewart that is, uh, you know, completely embedded in us as we go along. You moved to L.A. in 76, Al. Hollywood Hills, Time Passages was released. It seems like you felt you had to feel that things were were really going on a, a wonderful run for you at that mo at that time. Yes and no. OK. Um, I mean, we had a couple of top 10 hits, which is lovely. It's delightful. Uh, for me, it was like visiting a foreign country. Um, oh. I, I thought, well, I don't live here, but I don't mind coming here and seeing what it's all about. Right. Um, 
and and what it was all about was being on the road <laughs> yeah year of the cat i mean we spent i think eight eight months or something nine months or some incredible length of time uh you know like being on the road all the time the record was in the charts i was out touring and so i never got to do any of the things that rock stars do i mean right. i you know hang around with groupies and, and, and they, you know right. it, it was a, a tragedy really because by the time i came back everyone had forgotten about it and wild and, the, the other crazy thing about those two records is that, um, well, all the records, Past, Past, Present and Future, Modern Times, Year of the Cat, and uh, Time Passages, my face is not on the front cover of any of those albums. Right. So nobody knew what I looked like. So oh. I, I came back and I was totally incognito. I, I could walk, and, and during Time Passages, I did. I could walk down Sunset Boulevard to Tower Records, which is the epicenter of the music business. Yep. And during that entire year, I was never once recognized by anybody. <laughs> my face is not on the front cover of the record. So it was like it was like being um, an incognito rock star. It's a very weird sensation. That is. And, but to me, it was perfect because, I, you know, as a writer, you want to be a fly on the wall. You don't want to be the wall. You know? Right. You, right. You, you want to be able to see everything and take everything in and write about it without anyone paying any attention to you whatsoever. And somehow or other, I managed to achieve that. Right. <laughs> uh, well, you you absolutely did. Uh, those songs and that albums and those albums are immortal no matter what goes on. They they really are, and I, I I have to tell you again that 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 hearing those songs makes me feel of when I was younger, when I was happy, and the response. It's just it's it's you've done it for us, and I thank you for that. Honestly, that is, it means the world that your music does that for us. Um, the eighties hit. Um, you basically did twenty four carats. You did the live Indian summer, which was your first live record, right? Um, with yeah. shot in the shot in the dark was your backup band and then recorded on that live record or, or was on the live record with you. Yeah. Um, yeah. As you went along. Um, it was around, um, I guess, 81 ish, 82, where you parted company with the band, Luke O'Reilly and you split your, your time. And then you stopped playing for a while. What was the Al Stewart mindset at that point of your life and career? Oh, um, I got into the, the wine business. <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, I, 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 things that no one knows about me i am actually a master counselor of french wine i'm i'm a, I'm a metro concern I, I was going to bring that up i read about that and i'm like oh, that's very and i thought okay well i did the pop thing and, and that was fun and i wrote all these songs and um and then i, I my best friend at the time in los angeles ran the, the most successful wine store in, in in town it was in beverly hills oh. beverly hills wine merchant and we decided that we were going to uh, start a vineyard and we got together with a friend of mine was the bass player in, in Boston. You remember the band Boston? I sure do. Yeah. More than a feeling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fran, Franny, Fran Sheehan. And so yeah. Fran Sheehan and, and Dennis Overstreet and myself were going to start a vineyard. Oh. And um, we went to, we had a real estate agent offer us this property. Um, we were going to get investors. It were, we're not putting up our money. I mean, it, it sounded incredible to me. You put up like a small sum of money. You have 17 investors come in and they, they put up the rest of it and you run it. And I said, we, we can do this. You know, Fran, Fran was definitely into wine, loved wine. And Dennis, of course, I mean, he has a store. We can sell our wine in Dennis' store. What could possibly go wrong? And... Um, so uh, we we identified a property. It was a lovely property. It was a hundred acres in Napa, and um, you know we 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 strolled around it and and we thought, yeah, that this is it. We're going to buy this. Right. And uh, Boston happened to have a concert um, in San Francisco right before uh, before we made our offer, and it was called a day on the green, and and um, they, they drew sixty thousand people. It was a free concert, oh. and uh, it was all on the front page of the San Francisco Chronicle. And the real estate agent, um, our property, the, what was going to be our property, was owned by C's Candy. Right. And next door was Mrs. Walt Disney, who had a pro property right next door. And uh, the real estate agent, we made our offer. It was accepted. And the real estate agent at the last moment went to Mrs. Walt Disney with the front page of the San Francisco Chronicle. Oh. And said there are sixty thousand long-haired hippies that are all going to move in next door to you. And she said, "Quote: What will it cost to stop it?" And, oh. and he upped the price half a million dollars. And she said, "Can I write a check right now?" And did. 
And uh, that was it. That was why I'm not in the wine business. Oh, that's spectacular. Well, we'll talk about the uh, the Down in the Cellar album, uh, the beginning of the 21st century that you wrote. But give me a, a, a nutshell, because I know I don't want to keep you forever, although I could talk to you for 10 hours. Tell me a little bit about the 80s and 90s. What were, what was that to Al Stewart? What, what, what were the, the highlights and the moments where you were continuing your life and you were going on playing and singing? What were... Well, what... I, I, I did play, but um, the 80s were really, for me, it was all about really learning wine. I mean, you know, learning the, the whole inside out of it. And so I was reading books all day and I was going to tastings every night. I wanted to drink every great Bordeaux made in the 20th century. Oh. And I came extremely close to accomplishing that. <laughs> That's phenomenal. God. And, uh, I wanted to be able to, you know, be given a glass of, of, of wine blind and tell you what it is. I wanted to get to that point. Right. And um, of course, nobody can do that all the time, but I did do it a few times and uh, much to the astonishment of the people around oh. me and much to my astonishment, you know. I mean, there are some things, uh, you know, 80, 89 Aubryon or 82 Pichon Lalonde, which I, you know, you absolutely know what it is as soon as you taste it because it doesn't taste like anything else. Right. And so I wanted to get really good at that. And then after I'd got really good at that, um, I decided to go back and be a folk singer again. So um, I, I, I got the acoustic guitar out and uh, got rid of the band and became a folk singer again. Oh, uh, nice. And then in the 90s, uh, I worked solo for a while as a folk singer. And then um, I started working with another guitar player. And uh, eventually, ha, wonderfully, uh, I hooked up with a band from Chicago called The Empty Pockets. And oh, yes. The last six or seven years, I've, I've been working with them. Oh, and they've, that's been an incredible run with, with them. It's, I've, I've heard about them for many years, been we're trying to work interviews with them too. And that had to be absolutely wonderful to have them as a, as a, as a background. Is that, is that felt really, really good, good to you to have them on board? Well, I have to say yes, because one of them standing right up there. Yeah, all right. <laughs> no, it's been, it's been great. I mean, it, it's a real camaraderie, you know, I mean, uh, it, it, it's just fun because we tell jokes all the time. I mean, uh, they're all really sharp and, and uh, really, really clever and fast witted. And um, if you're in the dressing room be before the show, I mean, it's just a constant back and forth of, you know, kidding around and, and joking and making up stories. And, and it, it's, it's delightful. Right. And you've continued to play, as we talked about, you're, you know, you're playing tonight, you're playing tomorrow, you're, you're, the touring is continuing to go. I love that. Um, you know, Al Stewart, I got to tell you, uh, again, uh, your music is part of our souls. And um, it is whether you like it or not. I want some wine. I got to find out what wine you're most like now, because that'll, <laughs> that'll cap everything. I can have year of the cat with one of those Bordeaux. And I think my life is going to be fulfilled. But I yeah. know you're playing. They're playing the Birchmere on March 16th in about two weeks. Um, I would love to get there. I'm going the next night to the Smithereens and and stuff like that. And I would love to come in and say hello if I get a chance. But look, I want to say thank you profusely for honoring me with this living on music ride we just took. Al, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for your interest. And uh, you know, I, I hope it's been somewhat amusing. <laughs> oh, just magnificent. And um, you know, again. Um, Friends like Susan and, and Lori are are still in love with your music, and so are so many people. So you should feel really, really good about that. Well, I do. I mean, you know, you've got to do something with your life. Why not this? You know. <laughs> right. Well, again, congratulations on your ongoing career and your wonderful triumphs and the music that's in our hearts. And thanks for being on Living on Music, Al. Well, thank you. All right, man. Uh, speechless uh, is where I felt after that interview. I um. Again, uh, the music that you listen to when you're younger and your your music is becoming part of your soul and it's it's you're you're formulating who you are in a lot of ways through the music that you love. And Year of the Cat, Time Passages Two on the Border, Year of the Cat especially, were was was a song and was a sound and was a feel that I'll never forget. And neither will I forget just talking to him. I hope you enjoyed that. Al Stewart. Thank you so much. Josh Solomon, thanks you so much. It's wonderful that the, the, one of the guys who was really helping Al on tour as well um, is also in the band that's playing with him, The Empty Pockets, and I hope to have them. Uh, we talked about him on the show. Uh, we hope I hope to have them on uh, Living on Music too. But Al Stewart, thank you for the music you gave me that's still right here in my soul and always will be, and also what you're doing now. I keep in close touch um everybody living on music uh is continuing on we are uh going to do uh what we're calling annual contributor levels because 
since from the beginning of the show until now, it has been pro bono. Um, there has been no income from the show because it was during the pandemic and advertising wasn't going to be easy. And also um, it, I built it through through the Zebra Press and we were doing everything pro bono as the pandemic was going and figuring out our shows and our places in the in the Zebra Press ZTV realm. And then Living on Music began to grow and went beyond uh, what I thought it was even going to be doing. And for three years, it's to be three years in April, we've been doing Living on Music. And what we're doing is we're going to ask people uh, who are in the Living on Music Nation or, or even if you're not or want to join um, for um, to be part of our the legacy of living on music and to be part of of what we're doing and that means annual contributions and we're talking anything that people can do is wonderful i've already had a couple that have been marvelous trisha wardino kicked off the the donating uh unbelievably um with what she was doing um uh, listening to living on music and, and being a part of that and she's a music fan big time and a music person uh also and so she donated um, a wonderful amount. And also Melissa Quinn Fox, um, one of my guests, an amazing Americana country artist. So people are starting to build that. So we're going to we're coming out with something very soon. that talks about that if it's not out already when this uh, premieres, um, which I think it will be. Check it out. Become part of Living on Music by being an annual contributor. And also there will be perks here and there. Um, we talked about the tickets to the smithereens. Um, you know, to be able to um, go and, and enjoy that show um, with Living on Music. And, you know, that's part of it if, if you're a part of the donations and, uh, and the contributions. Anyway, uh, if you want to be part of Living on Music or know somebody who does, they can go to Facebook, um, join the Living on Music Facebook group, or you can go and subscribe to the YouTube channel, uh, Living on Music with Steve Hawk on YouTube. And that's a lot of the most recent um, episodes and excerpts that we've had. Um, and it's a wonderful uh, place to kind of get to be a part of, of what we're doing. And the podcast group, uh, you go to Spreaker, the base right here, but you can also go to the any podcast app that you have, uh, all the big ones, Spotify, iHeart, Google, Apple, everything. And you'll just search for Living on Music with Steve Huck. And there is the podcast version of the show that we do uh, for video. Anyway. Thanks so much, Al Stewart. Thanks so much, everybody. Got some wonderful local guests coming out uh, soon, uh, if not already, when this premieres. Sela Campbell, the amazing 16-year-old singer-songwriter from Loudoun County, is going to be a guest. Um, we've got the band Indigo Thursday, a bunch of high schoolers, uh, women, ladies, amazing, fun band. Sounds like, um, again, the Runaways to me. Uh, and I did a live hit with them. And then also, um, uh, following Al Stewart, we'll have Jim Babjack, who's the unbelievable founding guitarist of the Smithereens. And we'll be talking to him and also hoping for Gina Shock from the Go-Go's. Still waiting on that commitment, so hopefully I'll have it. Anyway, thanks for joining me. And don't forget, through anything, um, if you're feeling great or if, even if you're feeling down and need a little help, there's always music. It's, it's an essential part of our souls and keeps us going. So don't forget to keep living on music.